It's my honor to be the one who wraps up the Earl Davies Symposium today, and thank you all for sticking around. Um, in the next 20 minutes, I'll be discussing vaccine-induced immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia, VITT, and I'll be referring to this entity as VIT. Um, and I'll also be discussing briefly about the experience of British Columbia in the evaluation and management of uh, VIT. I don't have any relevant uh, disclosures. And I think uh, a good start uh, of the discussion is uh, defining VIT and talking a little bit about the epidemiology of this new entity. So VIT is a rare prothrombotic um, a, a disorder that can happen after exposure to one of the adenoviral vector vaccines like AstraZeneca or Johnson & Johnson. And it has been referred to as uh, TTS, uh, thrombosis and thrombocytopenia syndrome in some of the literature, as well as VIPIT, vaccine-induced prothrombotic immune thrombocytopenia, but the consensus, consensus now is to uh, stick with VIT. Um, there are no definite VIT cases after exposure to mRNA vaccine. There was a suspected case of uh, VIT uh, in the United States after Moderna, but that was not confirmed. And the, the final conclusion was that that was a case of spontaneous hit. So everything started in April when uh, there were several case reports and case series published in the literature from different regions in the world. Uh, starting from Norway, in which five patients were reported after exposure to AstraZeneca vaccine. And then in Germany, there was 11 patients. And in the States, there was a report of 12 patients uh, after exposure to Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, so the incidence is variable from region to region in the world. Um, I have to highlight that in Norway, uh, the incidence was the highest, uh, which was 1 in 26,000 individuals. And in the States, it was about one in 500,000 individuals, and, and this is really a very low incidence, to be honest. Um, people were asking about um, uh, risk of having VIT after second dose of AstraZeneca, and, and the data came from UK, in which um, uh, they reported five, uh, 15 cases of uh, VIT after 9 million second doses of AstraZeneca, and that is an incidence of about one in 600,000 doses. The case fatality was initially high when the, the disease started uh, in April. That's because the management was not very well established, but nowadays the case fatality dropped significantly to 20% uh, or even less than 20% in some of the literature. In Canada, the first case of uh, VIT was reported in Quebec in April 2021 this year. And again, the incidence is uh, variable from province to province. In Ontario, for example, the, the incidence is about 1 in 61,000. In BC, the incidence is about 1 in 92,000. And here in BC, we investigated 68 individuals with uh, suspected VIT, out of which three were confirmed to be um, uh, cases of uh, true VIT. Uh, of these three patients, uh, no mortality was observed. So I want to spend some time discussing the pathophysiology of, uh, of VIT, albeit not very well understood, uh, but I think um, a good way to discuss the pathophysiology of VIT is to remind ourselves about the pathophysiology of HIT, which in, there are similarities between these two entities. Now, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia happens after exposure to heparin. It's most of the time heparin-dependent, uh, and what happens is that heparin uh, binds to platelet factor 4, which uh, uh, results in neoantigen uh, exposure on PF4 that will stimulate B cells to produce anti-PF4 heparin antibodies, and the immune complex then can activate platelets, and some of the patients will uh, go on to develop thrombosis. Now, there are several types uh, of HIT. Uh, classic HIT is the one that is heparin dependent, but there are cases in which HIT can happen independent of, of any exposure to heparin, and these are called spontaneous HIT. And what happens here is that the patient will have some 
uh, other polyannuals. So, so uh, heparin is characteristically known to be a, a polyannual. So these patients will have uh, other types of polyannuals circulating in the plasma that will bind to PF4 and results in, in conformational change that will stimulate the formation of antibody, antibodies. And characteristically, spontaneous hit is seen after uh, orthopedic surgery, particularly knee replacement surgery. In some of the patient, medical patients, spontaneous hit can be seen after uh, bacterial or viral infection. Now, the pathophysiology of VIT is very similar to that of spontaneous HIT in a sense that it's not heparin dependent. So I want to highlight this study that was published in Nature. And this study looked at the binding sites of VIT antibody and compared that with the binding sites of uh, HIT antibody. And what the study found essentially is that the, the binding sites of HIT antibodies on PF4 are different from those of uh, VIT antibodies. Uh, in fact, um, HIT antibody uh, typically has a specific uh, binding site on PF4, unlike VIT antibody, which can be uh, polyspecific. Now, that, that, that point is very important because it explains one of the uh, 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 significant um, uh, uh, problems that we see in, in the lab when we, in, when we try to investigate cases of VIT. And, and initially when VIT started, people didn't know what's going on, but now we know what's the problem. So this is related to the first line screening assay that we use to investigate cases of HIT. And that is uh, uh, an assay which is developed by Instrumentation Laboratory Hemocell. And uh, it's a competitive assay. So in cases of HIT, so basically the assay utilizes uh, latex particles that are coated with monoclonal antibodies that are similar to HIT antibodies. And so when you get a plasma from a patient with HIT and mix it with this reagent, the HIT antibody will compete with, uh, with the monoclonal antibody that is coating this latex particle and will cause displacement of the monoclonal antibody. And that will, really, will, will, will result in decreased agglutination that will then be detected spectrophotometrically by the change in light absorbance. Because VIT antibodies have different binding sites from HIT antibodies, if you use this assay to screen for VIT, you will get false negative results because the VIT antibody will not compete with that monoclonal antibody that is coating the latex particle. And this is very important because the recommendations came to uh, uh, avoid using this assay to screen for cases of VIT. Another study that I want to highlight is uh, this one which was published by uh, Greinacre and his colleagues. And this study looked at the mechanisms of which uh, VIT causes uh, uh, thrombosis and stimulates antibody formation. Uh, this study tried to understand what in the vaccine is, is specifically the part that stimulates the antibody formation. And what they found is that uh, most likely uh, the outer coat of the adenoviral vector, which is also known as hexone, is the part that is implicated in cases of VIT. So that, that binds with, PF with PF4 and stimulates the antibody formation. The other mechanism that happens is the formation of or release of uh, neutrophil extracellular traps which are procoagulant components, as you know. So this image um, shows the, the, the complex of PF4 on the, on the surface of platelets with the adenoviral vector. And, and the, the, the next image on the right shows the complex, which is uh, also bound to the immunoglobulin. A little bit about the clinical manifestations of VIT, obviously uh, thrombosis. Is, is the main uh, 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 symptom that patients have. And usually thrombosis in these patients will be in an unusual sites like uh, these splanchnic veins or 
cerebral veins, and some patients will even have arterial thrombosis. Uh, thrombocytopenia, of course, uh, is another symptom, another symptom, and usually these patients will present within uh, four to 28 days after exposure to uh, one of the adenoviral vector vaccines. The diagnosis is confirmed by PF4 ELISA assay, and the PF4 ELISA assay is usually positive if the optical density is more than 0.4, but in cases of BIT, uh, the optical density tends to be between two to three. Uh, the, the ELISA itself can be um, diagnostic in the right clinical context, but in some cases, you can have false positive ELISA, and therefore, in, in some of the cases, you will have to confirm the diagnosis by, uh, by using a, a functional assay uh, like the serotonin release assay. And I just want to show this study which uh, was uh, uh, conducted in Norway. They looked at uh, individuals who were vaccinated with AstraZeneca and they, they performed PF4 uh, ELISA on, on these individuals and they found that in, in 492 individuals who are asymptomatic with no thrombocytopenia, normal platelet count, uh, six individuals had uh, a positive PF4 ELISA, which was false positive. These, these individuals were healthy. Uh, they, they didn't have any, any clinical issues. Um, I, I, I want to uh, show you one of uh, the three patients with VIT that were diagnosed here in BC. And, and this is the clinical course of this patient. Um, so day zero, when, he got, when the patient got the vaccine, and then around day 12, the patient started to have symptoms. And this patient actually had a, a difficult clinical course. Uh, the patient had a portal vein thrombosis and, uh, and, and, and required uh, a surgical resection uh, because of uh, bowel ischemia. But uh, immediately when the patient uh, started having symptoms, the patient was given IVIG doses. And uh, you can see the, the, the black, cir uh, the bla uh, the black uh, squares uh, represent the platelet count, the line of the platelet count, and the black triangle is the line for the uh, D-dimer. So initially when the patient presented, the patient had a platelet count of about uh, uh, around 50. And after given IVI, and the D-dimer at that time was about uh, above 35 milligram per, uh, per liter, which is very high. So once, once the patient received uh, IVIG, the platelet count improved and D-dimer dropped. Uh, and at that time, when uh, PF4 ELISA results came back, it showed uh, optical density of 2.6, which is, again, very high. So... The patient continued uh, to be on anticoagulation therapy, of course, uh, non-heparin anticoagulation, and uh, D-dimer gradually dropped to uh, more recently undetectable, or less than, uh, less than five. And, and, and the platelet count uh, initially went up to close to 300, but then there was a drop in the platelet count again, so we repeated PF4 ELISA, and it was still positive at 1.3. The patient got another dose of IV, IVIG, and, and there was a slight improvement in the platelet count, but then the platelet count plateaued. So this is about now uh, 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 more than six months since the patient uh, uh, first presented, and we repeated uh, PF4 ELISA after six months, which uh, continued to be positive, but at um, a lower level of optical density. So in BC, uh, when uh, the first reports of, B of, of VIT were, uh, were published in the literature, even before that, uh, a, a, a clinical care pathway was developed, and the idea was to uh, aid in the evaluation and management of, of cases of VIT, particularly in, in areas uh, uh, in rural and low resource areas. And through this clinical care pathway, 68 patients, as I said, were investigated, out of which three were uh, positive cases. 
So I don't want to go through the whole uh, clinical care pathway. It's actually available online, but I just want to highlight a few things. The patient uh, presents at local hospital. The uh, uh, standard uh, in, in blood investigations will be performed locally, and samples for PF4, ELISA, and SRA will be uh, sent to St. Paul's Hospital or Vancouver Island. These are the two sites that perform the PF4 ELISA. And, and if there was a high index of suspicion for VIT, uh, the PF4 ELISA will be performed within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, if not, then uh, the, the sample will be batched for twice weekly testing. And the, the clinical care pathway really shows uh, how to deal with these patients uh, from the time, you know, time of presentation. So this is what I just uh, said about the lab investigations of uh, uh, these patients and how to deal with samples from patients with suspected VIT. Uh, the last thing I want to show is uh, this, uh, um, these graphs uh, from the 68 uh, individuals who were um, evaluated for suspected VIT. And so we divided these 68 patients into three groups. The first group is, um, is, is the three positive, confirmed positive VIT cases. The, the other group is non-VIT, uh, but patients who presented with thrombosis for other reasons. And the third group is no, non-VIT and, and without thrombosis. And you just can't see that uh, the platelet count is significantly different between the three groups, and, and you know, more importantly, that platelet count in cases of VIT was significantly lower than the two groups. And also, the same thing can be observed with D-dimer and uh, PF4 ELISA. I just want to highlight that this, the shaded area represent the normal reference ranges. So the take-home messages from this presentation is uh, VIT is a very rare prothrombotic event, which is seen uh, uh, only after exposure to adenoviral vector vaccines. Um, the incidence is, ranges from 1 in 50,000 to 1 in 100,000. And it's linked, as I said, to adenoviral vector vaccines. Prompt diagnosis and management is uh, necessary to, to, um, to have a better outcome. Antibody formation is triggered by uh, poly. Uh, by polyanionic vaccine particles, and the clinical care pathway standardizes evaluation and, and, and management and reduces uh, mortality, uh, and the diagnosis is confirmed by PF4 ELISA and uh, uh, SRA in some cases, and obviously avoid using rapid enzyme immunoassay or latex particle immunoturbidometric assay for, for screening for cases of it. And I want to thank my uh, supervisors, Dr. Tyler Smith and Dr. Agnes Lee. Thank you. Questions? I have one for you. Um, what's the benefit of doing the serotonin release assay? What's that telling you? Yeah, so the serotonin release assay is platelet activation assay, which uh, looks at, uh, I mean, PF4 ELISA is just going to show you that if there is antibody circulating in the plasma or not, but uh, serotonin release assay is a functional assay that will uh, uh, gives you an idea if there is real platelet activation. And as I said, there are some cases with uh, uh, false positive ELISA, so uh, this this follows the, the, the model of the uh, ice, iceberg that are patients with uh, circulating antibodies, but they don't have any symptoms. So in these cases where you have false positive ELISA, you will need to confirm by serotonin release assay to make sure that these patients do not actually have platelet activation. Is, is there some reason that, that you couldn't do that by looking at CD62 expression on the platelet by flow cytometry? Is there like another alternative methodology than yeah. sending samples to McMaster? It, it is, it, it certainly it's pos possible and it has been um, done and published in the literature. Uh, I think that will be, um, we, we don't have the 
or I, I, we, uh, actually I shouldn't, have, I shouldn't say we don't have it, we have it, but it's, it's gonna be more sophisticated actually to do the uh, flow cytometry assay on these patients than sending uh, for SRA. Yeah. That was a great talk, thanks very much. Uh, Thank you. I'm at Prizegal. It's, uh, the, the frequency is about one in 75,000 in Canada. Uh, to, to put things into perspective, what is it for HIT? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure of the incidence of... of a lo it, a lot honest. higher. Yeah, yeah, yeah a lot, And that's an acceptable rate. Yeah. So, so let, just to put things into perspective. Uh, uh, my, my real question is, I haven't read this literature in a little, little while, namely a few months. Uh, have, have any risk factors for VITT been identified as yet? Um, so not really. The, the last uh, paper that was published actually last week by, um, in JTH um, looked at uh, a different, um, uh, the summarized, summarized the whole literature that, that is available since uh, VIT was, uh, you know, just went, uh, you know, was, was initially published. But I don't think, um, or maybe I'm not aware of any risk factors that can be pointed out. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Ed Conway. That was really interesting. Um, and one, the serotonin release assay, so my understanding is that um, you distinguish it really from HIT using, in, because it's positive in the absence of heparin. Is that not true? Sorry, say that again. It's positive. Mm -hmm. You get a release response with yes. VIT in the absence. You don't yes. require heparin to be added. That's true. Okay. So that's one. So, and then you, the, the word on the street is that you don't want to treat these patients with heparin. Mm -hmm. So can you explain why not? And in, in fact, in your patient, you treated, or Aggie's patient is treated with fundoparinux, which is mm. short version of the most uh, you know, active portion yeah. of heparin. So why is that? Because I understood that heparin could actually potentially compete with the immune complex formation. So why mm. would heparin be bad necessarily? If we've, um, got, if we've got the mechanism right. Yeah, I, I, so again, this is, uh, it, it's really new entity and there's a lot of things that we don't know about. Uh, and, and there are a lot of theories. Uh, and, and I think because heparin is a polyanion, it, it will probably, uh, uh, you know, uh, f further stimulate the antibody formation by binding to PF4. Uh, that's that's only my 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 guess. Uh, I'm not. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have any patients with HIT been um, diagnosed with VIT? Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So thank I, you. I, I, thank I, you. Apropos of Ed's question, I spoke to uh, Walkingtons and various other people, and people ran away from heparin initially. I think people agreed on the GG. But uh, I think that some people are receiving heparin. Mm. Uh, so uh, you know, the, the concern, obviously, was the overlap of the clinical syndrome that scared people off. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Carter. Okay. Thank you. Very Thank much. you.